Now, with the tax payable method, well, we've got two methods sitting there that could be used, and a lot of companies do use this method, but they're not companies that are reporting entities under this, the Australian accounting standards. So if the, the companies that are listed or other companies that need to use accounting rules, they'll be using the tax effect method. Now, what the tax effect method is, is the same as this, plus it's got an add-on bit to it. So it's actually, both methods use a tax payable method, but the tax effect has an extra bit added on, um, which is the deferred tax assets and deferred tax liabilities. So all tax payable is, if we come up to the next bit, is if I have a small business and I make a thousand, if I work out that I've got a thousand dollars in taxable income and the tax rate is 30 percent, I owe the government 30 dollars. And I would simply recognize a tax expense of 30 dollars, a tax payable of 30 dollars, which would be your current tax liability. To the extent that I pay them all back and, you know, I'm a good taxpayer, so I do that, I debit tax payer or current tax liability or income tax payable $30 and I'd credit cash $30. So ultimately what's happening is the amount of your tax expense on your profit and loss is the same as how much you paid or you owe the government. And that's quite simple because you've got to work out your tax stuff anyway. You do all of that, you figure out what your bill is to them or to the government, pay it or, or owe them and that is your tax expense on your financial statements. The tax effect method is what SSB 112 requires. And it's, we need to do the first step, which is figure out how much we owe the government. And we've got to do that anyway. So this isn't an extra bit that the accounting forces upon us. That is going to be done by companies because they owe, they have to do it as part of legislative requirements. But the extra bit is this. Do, 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 do. Where is it? Plus the impacts of any deferred tax assets and deferred tax liabilities. So we've got to look at how these are impacting what's going on in terms of our, of, our, yeah, of our expense item. Now, before we get into what they are, it's probably best to cover what they're not. And what they're not is that, and I'm just going to focus on deferred tax liabilities. A deferred tax liability is not money that you owe the government in two years' time or in five years' time or in ten years' time. That's not what it is. What a DTL is, I'm just going to focus on them, what a DTL is saying is that there is going to be something that happens in the future. And that, may, that event may not actually happen, but there is something which is likely to happen in the future. And if that happens, I'm going to have to pay more tax. A DTA is just the reverse of that, which is saying there's going to be something which happens in the future, and that means I'm going to pay less tax. But it doesn't mean that a DTL that I actually have a present obligation to the government. I don't have that. So it's not like a, you know, a short-term debt and a long-term debt. A current tax liability, you actually owe the government. A deferred tax liability is something is going to happen, which means you're going to have to pay more tax in the future. So it's, it's an important difference. Um, I'm going to skip this slide because it's better done at another point. So to work out the DTAs and DTLs and what they are and how to deal with them, what we have to do is it's called the balance sheet approach. So we actually sit down with the balance sheet and we have all our carrying values on the balance sheet. That's, so that's your accounting numbers. We sit there with your accounting balance sheet and then what we have to calculate for each item on your balance sheet, you've got to calculate what's called your tax base. So you've got to work out your tax base for each asset and each liability. Work that out figure out what the difference is, and that's obvious. once you've figured it out, the difference obviously rolls out really easily. Once you've got that difference, you've got to figure out, come up with whether or not it's a DTA and DTL, or, D, or DTL, and then calculate that amount, which is simply the temporary difference multiplied by whatever the corporate tax rate is at that point. And we're going to be going through an example of all of this. So to do it, look, that bit's easy. We know we're going to be given what the tax rate is, so that's a fairly straightforward bit. This is a little bit tricky, trying to figure out if it's going to be a DTA or DTL, and this bit is a little bit tricky because for each asset and each liability, we have to work out what the tax base is. Um, the carrying amounts, you guys know how to do that, that's just accounting as we've been doing over the last 10 weeks. <coughs> 
and often for what we're doing here, you'll just get given those numbers. So what is the tax base, how to calculate it, what's the temporary difference, and does it give rise to a DTA or DTL? Um, so the tax base of an item is the amount attributed to the asset or liability. That was a quick lead. Um, the tax base of an item is the, is the amount attributed to the asset or liability for tax purposes. So if you want to think about it this way, it's like having a balance sheet calculated under tax rules. So when we have a balance sheet for accounting rules that's created under all the various AASBs and we property plant and equipment and inventory and whatnot, what this is doing is saying, if we were to use tax rules for how we come up with a balance sheet item, what would that number look like? Um, the difference we've already talked about. So the tax base of an asset, so how we actually calculate it, is the amount that will be deductible for tax purposes against any taxable economic benefits that will flow to an entity when it recovers the carrying amount of the asset. So let's have a look at the first part of that, um, and I'll, we'll come back to the second bit. So we have machinery. Um, it costs $200,000. Tax depreciation is $20,000. The remaining cost will be deductible through depreciation. Revenue generated is taxable. And so the tax base of this asset, and we'll go through it in more detail, but the tax base of this asset is 180. Now, let's actually expand this out a bit and look at what we're dealing with. Let's assume this asset is one year old and it costs us $200,000. Um, it's been depreciated So the asset cost is $200,000. It's been depreciated over 10 years. So when the example that you've got in front of you, that's at time one. So if you look back at, um, on your slides, just when I had the definition of a tax base, the tax base of an asset is the amount that will be deductible for tax purposes against any taxable economic benefits. So when you spend $200,000 on this asset, and we're going to assume that you can get the tax deductions for it, and it's going to come down to, res to a residual of zero. So T0, T10. Over the course of 10 years, we are going to get we are going to get $200,000 worth of deductions. That's what that's saying. So when we buy the asset at T0, we know we are going to get $200,000 worth of deductions over that 10 years. And that's what the tax base is saying. The tax base of an asset is the amount that will be deductible for tax purposes. So the tax base at time zero is 200,000 because there has been no deductions to date. The tax base at time one is 180 because we've already deducted we've already de deducted $20,000. We've had that deduction happen already, so from time 1 onwards, we've got another $180,000 left. So in the example that you have when you're sitting there at time 1, you have $180,000 of tax deductions to make or that you can get, um, so the tax base is 180. 